Hey there! If you love exploring Christian philosophy and theology, you're in the right place. The video is about to get started, but first, I want to ask you a question. Do you find the content I produce on this channel valuable? If so, here are some ways you can help promote it. The first is completely free. Give this video a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Second, consider doing a one-time donation, kind of like a tip. You can do this in the form of a super chat or a super thanks below. Third, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get early access to videos, they get to be a part of a patron-only Facebook group we call TAC Academy, and patrons can participate in the book club that meets on Zoom once a month. The link to become a patron is in the description. Thanks to all my current patrons for your support. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to The Analytic Christian. I'm Jordan, and this is the channel that helps you explore Christian philosophy and theology. Today, we're going to be talking about hell. Now, C.S. Lewis wrote in The Great Divorce that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. And my, if you accept that view, uh, you might ask the question, will everyone eventually choose to leave hell? My guest today argues that the answer is yes, and it is Dr. Robert Hartman. He is a professor of philosophy at Ohio Northern University. Welcome, Dr. Hartman. It's good to be here, Jordan. Thank you for coming on. We're going to be discussing this paper you wrote called Free Will and the Moral Vice Explanation of Hell's Finality. So I'm really excited. Let's jump in here. Um, first, what is the paper about? Yeah, so the paper is essentially about a part of a traditional doctrine of hell that says hell is permanent. Nobody leaves hell. And a number of philosophers, including C.S. Lewis, have given philosophical explanations or justifications of that doctrine that appeal centrally to human character and free will. Now, my paper is says that that explanation is not going to work. <laughs> uh, and if we start off with those assumptions, people uh, are going to leave hell. Excellent. So that's okay, about. so first, why don't you lay out what the traditional view of hell is? Yeah, and I'm going to use a, a different uh, word here. I'm going to just say a traditional view of hell uh, has, I think, these three features. Number one, hell is populated. That is, some people are there uh, or will be there uh, at, at some point. Number two, hell is a place of punishment. Uh, that is, it's, a, it's contrary to the flourishing uh, of human persons, and in some way, uh, they're suffering there. Okay. And then third, it's permanent. For anyone who's in hell, uh, there's no escape, there's no leaving. Uh, that's the traditional view of hell, um, or yeah. The traditional a traditional view. view. At, the, at the least, it's a traditional view. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, so how exactly is this view of hell supposed to be in tension with theism? According to 1 John, right, God is love. And let's suppose that God loves everyone. Uh, this is an, an Arminian idea, really wants uh, they're everyone to be to be saved. And why would God want everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, right? First uh, Timothy 2, 3 through 4. Uh, well, we can ask, what is love? Uh, not the, the dance party song, but um, love is a desire for the good of the beloved and for union with the beloved. And the good for human persons is their flourish, they flourish in relationship with God. So God's desire for their good just amounts to God's desire for this full-blooded union, this deep relationship with them. And hell is just the absence of that deep full-blooded relationship. Maybe there's some kind of union there, but it's thin, minimal, uh, and it's contrary to, to the flourishing uh, of human persons. Yeah. Now that characterization of love, 
I think that comes from Eleanor Stump. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was my dissertation advisor uh, uh, a while back, and it comes from Aquinas originally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what is now that we see what the tension is supposed to be? What is the free will explanation uh, of the finality of hell, and how is it supposed to resolve this tension? Yeah. So we need to ask initially. Why are people in hell? Who's at fault? Uh, is God at fault um, for for this problem, or are human persons at fault for this problem? And the free will explanation uh, that C.S. Lewis and many others want to give is that the the problem is in human free will, uh, essentially, and they want to say that. Human freedom can not only explain why some people are in hell, but it is actually a really fruit, theoretically fruitful idea. It can explain why hell is populated. It can explain the punishment of hell. Uh, and it can explain the permanence of hell as well. So let me say a little something about the kind of free will uh, that these philosophers have in mind here. And then I'll get into exactly how the explanation works. So... The idea is a libertarian idea of freedom, uh, that it's incompatible with, my acting freely is incompatible with my actions having been causally determined by factors outside of my control. Mm -hmm. So if I've got free will, then I have robust causal options, you know, to go this way or to go that way. Um, okay. So that's the kind of free will we have um, in mind here. So how does that explain why hell is populated? The idea is that some people freely choose to live life on their own terms, not in submission to, to, to God. They reject God's invitation to salvation, or they make choices with foreseeable consequences uh, free choices with foreseeable consequences that amount to uh, rejection of God's invitation to salvation. And so you might ask, well, why can't, if God's omnipotent, why can't God just cause them to freely accept God's invitation to salvation? Well, the kind of free will we have here uh, makes that proposal something like asking whether God can make a square circle. It's, it's nonsense. Uh, it's no limitation on divine power that God's not able to do nonsense. Um, okay, so that's, that's the basic idea for how free will can explain why hell is populated. What about, what about the punishment of hell? The idea for the free will explainers, the C.S. Lewis types out there, is just that Hell is not some medieval torture chamber where God is externally imposing suffering on damned persons. Rather, the punishment of hell uh, comes from uh, the nature of the sinful actions themselves and the kind of vicious character, the morally bad character traits that sit sinful free actions generate in the character of, of human beings. So we see many portraits of this in The Great Divorce about how uh, suffering or how sin has deformed human persons in a way that they're, they're always wanting what they don't want. Uh, so whatever they choose, uh, even when they get some pleasure, they're also suffering. And that's the hellish characterization uh, of the human psyche. <clears throat> you see the idea in Milton or Dante, um, but Milton very famously, he's got this great line about Satan. He says, whichever way I fly is hell, myself am hell. <laughs> mm. um, which really characterizes this idea that the suffering of hell is concomitant or it comes with um, being in this uh, robustly sinful and morally vicious state. Mm -hmm. And how does free will attach to that? Well, the idea is just that these moral vices um, have been freely acquired. And so 
the punishment is God's giving people over to themselves um, and their in their sinful ways. Okay, that's one way that we see divine punishment manifest in the scriptures in Romans one. Mm-hmm. Um, so, kind of a natural consequence of their sinful actions is it it forms their character in such a way that they become these vicious people, and that ends up resulting in your kind of miserable existence or something like that. Yeah, very nicely summarized. Thank you, Jordan. Now, did you, uh, so you you talked about the nature of the punishment and uh, as a result of their free will. Um, Was there anything else you wanted to say about that free will explanation before we move on? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I should say, I should also give the free will explanation about the permanence uh, of hell, how hell is locked from the inside. So recall that people in hell have these moral vices. They're, they're gluttonous, they're lustful, they're greedy, uh, they're proud, envious, slothful, wrathful. These are the capital vices in, in the Christian tradition. And uh, whatever moral vices are dominant uh, in them are going to color and shape the kinds of reasons that are attractive to them, that motivate them to act in various ways. Um, But also, those same moral vices are going to silence contrary reasons. So I'll give you a pedestrian example. Um, My character totally silences reasons uh, to gamble on my life savings. (laughs) It's not attractive to me at all. Uh, I can see how how bad of an idea that would be. It's unthinkable for me. My character actually prohibits me uh, from freely gambling my life savings, at least in ordinary examples, uh, precisely because I see there's no reason uh, that can be marshaled on its behalf. So now think about the viciously spiteful person. The viciously spiteful person can see no genuine reason to rejoice in the good of another, right? Because uh, spite is, you know, glorying in their downfall. Um, And so then the reason why hell is locked from the inside on this view is that the moral vices of damned persons, persons in hell, just silence all reasons for repentance. And so they can't see a genuine reason to open the door. And because free actions must be done for reasons, uh, it's impossible for them, say C.S. Lewis and others, uh, to repent. Hell is permanent. They're, they're locked in there uh, because of their, their own free choices that have formed this character. And now their character prevents any future free actions. Uh, to to open that door of salvation. So this is the free will explanation then for the uh, population, the punishment, and the and the permanence of hell. Mm-hmm. One thought comes to me here. I think in reading uh, that book, Glittering Vices, I know that this there's this idea of like you becoming um, bent in on yourself. You've probably heard that kind of visual uh, in terms of like a vice. Uh, it, it turns from like someone else to turning in on itself or, or something like that. So maybe the thought is these people on the inside, it's not like they want to leave. They're like, there's, there's this kind of, uh, when you're bent in on yourself, you can't really like see out. Uh, I don't know if I'm characterizing that very well, but then the door, you're not going to open the door. There's, if you're kind of consumed with yourself, you're just not going to be looking for a way out. Yeah, I think that's a nice explanation. So if you've got um, the vice of, of wrath, for example, and you want, you really want uh, to bring the pain uh, to, to other people, and God says, hey, 
uh, come join me in a new way of life where acting wrathfully is going to be impossible. You're going to think, no way. That's what I care about. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, that's the idea. That's how we can be kind of bent in on our own desires that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in your paper, I know you, you said this very briefly at the beginning. Now that we've got the free will explanation on the table, in your paper, you're going to say, if you accept that explanation, what follows? Uh, yeah, I'm going to argue that uh, people, uh, I'm going to say it's really probable that people in hell are going to re freely repent uh, and leave for heaven. That is, in other words, this explanation appealing to the fixity of vicious character in, in damned persons that prevents their using their free will to repent. It's not a good explanation. Uh, it's, it's not going to work. Okay. Now, by the end of the interview, um, so right now what we're going to do is I want you to lay out your reasons basically for, for thinking that. But by the end, we're going to go through eight objections to your argument <laughs> and and see if it stands up so first though let's let's get your argument on the table here why do you think god can make interventions in vicious human character to reopen the possibility of people's freely choosing to repent in hell yeah good The basic idea is that the assumption that C.S. Lewis and, and, and other people um, are making is just that character is in damned persons is unalterable. It's unchangeable. Uh, and that's why we never going to get a reason to freely repent or never be able to see a reason to freely repent. But I want to resist that assumption. I think that assumption is false. Now, I agree that a morally, a viciously spiteful person is not in hell, is not going to enter onto some New Year's resolution where they're going to reform their character and, and stop being uh, viciously spiteful by their own free will. I think that their vice has been so wholeheartedly formed by, by this point um, that they're not going to even be able to see a reason to change that feature of themselves. But I think our character can be affected, influenced, and changed by circumstances that are external to us uh, and people that are external to us. I'm going to give you some examples now. Um, I'll give you non-theological examples at first, and then I'll give you theological examples where God actually does something like this. So note first that the character of children is formed entirely by factors outside of their control. Mostly their parents, maybe their parents' pals, if they're around a lot and, and shaping them, their, their mini community um, is going to be the most significant influence on their character. But even in adults, our character can change based on factors outside of our control. Uh, so think of Phineas Gage. He's the fellow that got a railroad spike through his head and Gage was no longer Gage. He changed from this person who was very calm and mild mannered to a person who was irritated and given over to uttering obscenities. Aristotle. That's a very nice way to say that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Aristotle highlighted that great and repeated misfortunes uh, in circumstances can have uh, a corroding effect on our character. So I think somebody who's uh, forced into slavery, uh, who has a very confined options, um, can see those those circumstances and the way people treat them is going to have uh, an effect uh, for the worse uh, on their own sense of uh, autonomy, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are some non-theological examples about how factors outside of our control can uh, really substantively influence our character. But notice that God does this sometimes. So when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, 
Pharaoh was previously going to say, yeah, Israelites, go out and worship the Lord your God in the wilderness. And then uh, God takes some action, um, pardons some character traits of Pharaoh's in some way. And then he's, that, that becomes unthinkable uh, for, for Pharaoh. He says, no, no, I'm not going to let your people go. Uh, they'll stay here uh, and serve me. Sometimes God can affect uh, features of our physical bodies in order to spur some kind of character growth. In the most extreme case, God turns Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel uh, into a beast right, for, for a while to learn humility. Or gives the apostle Paul uh, a thorn in the flesh right, um, in order to keep him from boasting to prevent um, him becoming proud because of the uh, greatness of the revelations that he was, he was given from God. Okay, uh, so I think these are all cases in which someone or circumstances outside of our control can have a significant effect uh, on our character. And look, God's omnipotent. Uh, if circumstances can do this, then certainly God can directly uh, influence our character in ways that give us, allow us to see new reasons to, right, going back to the C.S. Lewis metaphor, to open the door uh, and to, to repent. Um, mm -hmm. Whether we do repent or not, you know, that's up to us. But now what was supposed to fix and make hell permanent, the, this vicious character mechanism has been done away with. So certainly God can uh, do this. It's, a, it's another question entirely. Uh, whether God would. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. And we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that next. Before moving on, yeah, so we're just asking, can God uh, make some sort of intervention that would change your character such that now you do see reasons to open the open the door uh, and repent and leave hell? Um, so some of those examples resonate with me and others don't. I'll I'll say why, or I'll try to sketch why. The Phineas Gage example. When I reflect on that case, so this is the guy that got a railroad spike through his head and he lived, but his character was totally different. He had this, he was a mean guy after that, it seems. That was, that was my way of saying it. Um, I lean toward thinking, uh, look, he's, he's probably not morally responsible for uh, those actions now it's I don't I don't know what happened there I don't know if we even have the same person I don't know but I'm just saying it it seems like he's probably not morally responsible for those actions now um I don't want to say the people in hell upon God something outside themselves God making an intervention now they're no longer morally responsible right I get your point is just saying something outside something external to me can change my character. But in that specific example, the character change ruins your moral responsibility, kind of the whole free will uh, purpose, the thing that, that God's supposed to value here. Yeah. Um, let me, I'll, I'll let you comment on that. I want to say one more. Uh, the, the Pharaoh one. In that case, uh, it, it seems like an explanation that a lot of people give is, well, Pharaoh hardened his own heart first. That's like those occurrences occur first. And then after that, it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that might be seen as God kind of this very natural consequence of you like, okay, if you want to harden your heart, I'll turn you over. I'll let you uh, harden your heart and I'll even accelerate it or something. like I'll accelerate the hardening or something like that. Um, so in that case, though, um, I, I take it back to the people in hell. Obviously, that goes in the opposite direction. It's like, you want to become morally vicious? I'll accelerate the rate at which you become morally vicious. Uh, so I don't. those two examples don't exactly resonate with me, but the Nebuchadnezzar one and the Paul's thorn in the flesh do resonate with me. 
partly because it seems like they retain a kind of freedom uh unlike the phineas gage one uh or at least like morally moral responsibility um and the change is positive, unlike the Pharaoh case. It's not like they become more morally vicious. So those two cases do stand out to me like good, I guess, counterexamples to the claim that God couldn't make this sort of inter intervention. Okay, that was my that was my spiel. Cool. Yeah, I'll take them in reverse order. So uh, in the Pharaoh case, I agree with you that uh, in ex in the book of Exodus, that is how it's described. Uh, first, Pharaoh does harden his own heart. Um, but then, all, I, all I'm trying to argue is that factors outside of our control can influence, can change our character, and God's future hardening of Pharaoh's heart certainly did that. Uh, so I still think it's a good case uh, to illustrate this point of how factors outside of our control can influence and change uh, our character in various ways. Now, go to the Phineas Gage case. I agree with you that Gage is not responsible for his new character. Uh, but I think it's a, another question entirely about whether a person can act freely. Uh, so, so I think that you don't have to be responsible for your character um, in, in order to act freely uh, from that character. And this leads very nicely into an objection that you might have had uh, for, to, to my claim that God can give us new reasons to repent by changing our character. Because you might think that if God changes our character or masks our character in, in certain ways, and then we make a choice on the basis of that new character that's not mine in any substantial sense, it's like given to me by God, uh, then I couldn't act freely. You might, you might think that. Uh, the assumption underneath this objection is that a person, I call it the character condition, a person acts freely only if they act from character traits that they have previously freely formed. Uh, and if that claim is true, that character condition is true, uh, then God couldn't give us new reasons <laughs> um, to repent in this way, because the character that God gives me is not freely formed by me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the free will explanation, uh, C.S. Lewis type people, uh, and other philosophers of religion like Jerry Walls, Kevin Timpey, and others, they're not going to go for the character condition uh, because it actually implies with other extremely plausible premises that free will is impossible. Let me briefly sketch the argument. It's from Galen Strawson. Um, think about a youth. They've got the cognitive and volitional capacities to perform their first free action. They finally got them. Whatever they are, uh, they've got them. Yeah. Uh, but they're acting from character by hypothesis that they have not freely formed because they're about to perform their first free action. And if my performing a free action requires having performed previous free actions that have formed my character, uh, that explains my action, um, then it's going to be impossible for me to perform my first free action. And if I can never perform a first free action, if that's impossible, I can never become a free agent. Free will itself is impossible. And so given that um, proponents of the free will explanation are committed, at the very least, to the possibility uh, of free will, they are not going to go in for this objection. Uh, and so I think I'm, again, in good standing. <laughs> yeah, I've defeated yeah. the objection uh, yeah. that God can make these kinds of interventions to reinstate my ability uh, to see reasons to repent and so to freely repent. Good. All right. So now let's move on to why you think God would make those sort of interventions. Now that you've said, okay, God can, 
Well, let's turn to why you think God would make such interventions. It's the part of the free will explanation uh, of divine love that goes like this. Uh, God loves all people at all times, before death and after death. God doesn't change. Uh, there's no inexplicable motivational shift uh, uh, in God where Prior to death, God wants the salvation of all. And then after death, you know, uh, forget about them. <laughs> uh, let's, let's leave them to their, themselves. So if God doesn't change and God loves people, uh, then God continues to want people to be saved even after death. Okay, so that's the first bit. The second bit is just to notice that God's intervening in human character where those persons are in hell uh, is entirely in character for God to do. So think about the pre-mortem case. Uh, so before death, if somebody comes to a, start a saving relationship with God, then uh, God's grace would have needed to have been operative uh, in their life. Well, why is that? Well, it's Christian doctrine that people are, to use Jordan's phrase, bent in on themselves in such a way that they can't choose God on their own steam. That's the Pelagian heresy. Right? Uh, instead, God's grace has to come before to prepare their will, to enable them to see reasons to repent, and to loosen the bonds of, uh, of sin in their life in such a way where they can make a free choice to accept God's invitation to salvation or at least stop resisting God's invitation to salvation. It's a, it's a two-grace view. God's grace works at the beginning to enable people to respond positively to God's offer of salvation, which is itself uh, a, another act of grace, that God gives us uh, this, this out uh, and out of hell and into, uh, you know, possibility for eternal flourishing. So this is what God does for us. God makes these kind of character interventions, either by changing character for a time or uh, masking or suppressing the influence of our character uh, at a certain time to, to enable us uh, to make the free choice to repent. And if that's how God works in the premortem lives, so before death, and there's no change in God, we should expect God to act in that kind of way after death too. It would be in character uh, for God to, to do so. So that's the... Uh, that's the basic argument. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't have a lot of pushback there. That that does seem good. I, I suppose someone might try to say God might have some sort of overriding reason at that point, uh, post-mortem. Um, but you, you offer an objection to the, your argument here in the paper, so why don't you go ahead and say what that objection is? Okay. Yeah, I think that the probably the most powerful objection to my argument. So I think if you're going to dig in anywhere, it's going to be here. Uh, if I'm wrong, uh, this is probably where it is. Um, and it's the idea that, look, God wouldn't. I know God can, but God wouldn't make uh, these kinds of character interventions because uh, that is disrespectful to human autonomy. Uh, and respecting autonomy is really important. And so I agree. Here's my response now. I agree that respecting autonomy is very important. Uh, but I think that God can respect our autonomy to a sufficient extent in making these kinds of character uh, interventions. And I'm going to give you four reasons why that's true. So first, I want to highlight that human autonomy is not an absolute good. It's not a good that uh, is totally inviolable, that trumps all other goods. It's subject to trade-offs, like all the other goods uh, in 
our lives. And just note that people limit, you know, the, the state limits your autonomy when they make seatbelt laws, right? Or they make laws against dueling. Um, or um, maybe this is, uh, you know, a trigger warning here. If somebody is attempting to commit suicide, uh, that might be an expression of their autonomy, but you might prevent them from doing so uh, in an attempt to promote their well-being. You think what's best for them is uh, that they not be able to go through with this. And um, so if any of these examples seem like uh, good examples, then we see that autonomy is not absolutely valuable sometimes. Uh, when it's important to promote somebody's well-being or to promote the common good, it's okay to limit somebody's autonomy to some extent. And just note that the case here is like infinitely higher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we're moving from infinite languishing to you know infinite flourishing uh, uh, with, with God in, in heaven. So if these limitations of human autonomy uh, in these lower stakes cases that we see common in our day-to-day -day lives, in our law, in our interpersonal relationships, um, then it looks like it's probably going to be justified uh, in this case for God, in this really high stakes case. Okay, uh, three more things to say. First, I don't imagine that God is going to be nitpicking us in a way that he's intervening constantly. Uh, in the lives of damned persons. Maybe these interventions occur like once every five years or once every four years. Uh, that would still be enough. Uh, and, and in my argument, and I'll say why a little bit more. Okay, uh, enough teasers. I'll, I'll tell you why now. Uh, it's just that hell never ends, right? So even if the interventions occur once every four years, that's still a potentially infinite number uh, of opportunities to repent. Okay. Mm. The, the third thing to say is that God's interventions in our character are small. I'm not, re I'm not imagining here is that God revamps people and gives them a new character. He intervenes in such a way as just to give them the opportunity to see new reasons uh, to repent. Uh, which gives them an opportunity uh, to freely repent. They might harden their own heart again, and then, uh, you know, five years later or something, God intervenes. Okay. And the last thing to note is that human persons still have autonomy over whether they're in heaven or in hell. Uh, God's not making the choice for them. Uh, God is intervening in their character in such a way that puts a choice before them, but then they have the free choice, either to freely repent or uh, to keep doing things their own way. So I think that this, these kinds of considerations highlight that God respects the autonomy of human persons in hell well enough um, to to think that this is the thing that, you know, God, a perfectly good being would do in a circumstance like this. God would limit our autonomy in certain ways, uh, in these small ways and over vast periods of time uh, in order to, every once in a while, reinstate our freedom to repent uh, and allow us to make whatever choice we make. Yeah. So you already kind of hinted at the question, but why do you think it's highly probable that each person will eventually leave hell for heaven? Yeah, good. So hell never ends. So even if God intervenes once every 10 years, once every eight years, that's still a potentially infinite number uh, of cases uh, where people will have an opportunity to freely repent. And because their character allows them to see reasons to repent, there's uh, some probability, even if it's small, um, because it comes from the periphery of their character. It's not who, you know, very deeply they are. It's just a little part of them uh, that uh, if given enough opportunities, probably at some point, I should say very probably at some point, 
they're going to make the free choice to repent. And I think that that could be, the probability could be bolstered by certain kinds of circumstances that God might put them in. Because uh, I'll say a little bit about social psychology and behavioral economics here and about human character in, in general. So since the 70s, social psychologists have been running these experiments. They're called, uh, uh, it's a literature called situationism, where mundane features of our circumstances have really surprising effects on human behavior. For example, uh, if you're in the mall and you're smelling Mrs. Field's cookies, um, that ambient aroma uh, greatly increases the probability um, that you'll engage in helping behavior. And you might have thought, no, that, that mundane circumstance wouldn't have that effect on our moral behavior, but, but it does. Or if there's a bunch of other people around you and somebody needs help and nobody else is doing it, that decreases greatly the probability that you'll help. This is what psychologists call uh, the bystander effect. Okay, so God's omniscient. God knows all of these features of our character. I, I would assume even though our character is more wholehearted around uh, moral vices in hell than it is in our pre-mortem lives here, uh, I would think that there would be still some of these surprising dispositions in our character and God might use Circ orchestrate circumstances uh, to, you know, increase the probability that we freely choose something that's for our ultimate good. And likewise, behavioral economics um, have been highlighting this uh, phenomenon called nudging. It's when you change, you orchestrate some feature of choice architecture to give somebody a, a nudge. You're not you're not really changing the economic incentives at all, uh, but uh, you're just giving somebody this little tiny nudge uh, to, to make a better choice. So uh, in a cafeteria, you might put healthy food at the eye level. That will increase the likelihood that people buy healthy food at the ca cafeteria. Or uh, there's this framing effect also where the doctor says, hey, 90% chance if you get the surgery that you need, you'll live. So if they frame it that way, you're more likely to get the surgery than if, for example, uh, they say 10% of people who get the surgery die. It's the same choice. It's a 90-10 scenario. But the way that it's framed, you know, in the, if it's framed in the positive way in terms of survival, that nudges us. Uh, to, to make the, the right, make the better decision. And I'm thinking that maybe God could nudge us uh, in these kinds of ways when we have that freedom uh, to repent reinstated. I think Jesus nudges people like, you know, in John 4, um, he gives the, he frames the offer of salvation to the woman at the well in terms of giving her living water. Uh, I think that that's a framing effect nudging uh, that, that Jesus was using there. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, God, again, being omniscient, God knows all these features about us. And so God can, I think, help us along a little bit. And that can raise the probability a bit that eventually, uh, at least on the assumptions and the free will explanation, yeah, that yeah. everyone will will freely or that each person will has a high probability that they'll eventually freely choose to repent. Yeah. Okay. So that was basically your argument for why you think that free ex free will explanation. If, if you accept that, then everyone in hell will eventually choose to repent and leave it. Um, we, I want to go through these eight objections and you, you go through them pretty quickly in the paper. So I don't think it'll take too much time. We got about 15 minutes left in the interview here. So objection one to your argument, God doesn't want reconciliation with damned persons in this way because damned persons are choosing for reasons that aren't ultimately their own. Yeah, good. So I think we've already uh, hinted at my response to, to this objection, and it's that I think that the objection relies on this uh, heretical 
Pelagian view um, that God wants us to choose God for reasons that are ultimately ours on our own steam. Um, and I think that Christian doctrine says, well, that's not true. Uh, even in the premortem case, our reasons to choose God are ultimately given by God's self. Um, and so we're not, even in the good case, in the, the, the usual case that we're familiar with, uh, we're not choosing for reasons that are ultimately our own, but are ultimately come from uh, God's lavishing grace on human persons. So I think that that defeats the first objection. All right, objection two. God's nudging damned persons by manipulating their choice architecture undermines their freedom of choice. Good. Uh, and here, I want to say that this objection, it would prove too much. Because if God's nudging people undermines their freedom of choice, well, I mean, I think of divine providence. Uh, God's sovereignly orchestrating the events of human history in a particular direction are just rife uh, with nudges. Um, and so that would mean that no one acts with free will because, you know, God is a providential God. And I think that that's not something that proponents of the free will explanation are going to be on board with. Uh, so I think that they themselves are going to reject uh, this objection. But I'll also say is that I wrote a book uh, titled uh, In Defense of Moral Luck, Why Luck Can Affect uh, Praiseworthiness and, and Blameworthiness, something like that. I think I got the title wrong. Um, <laughs> How Luck Often Affects Praiseworthiness and Blameworthiness. That's that's the title. Okay. And um, in it, I argue that uh, circumstantial luck, I think nudging is a, is a subset of that, just that the way in which our circumstances are outside of our control, that doesn't undermine our free will. So I've given a, a book-length defense uh, in refutation of this objection. So if you're really excited about uh, examining to see whether I've got it right, you know, you can, you can, I've shown my work elsewhere. Uh, you yeah. can go have a look at that book. All right. Objection three, a perfectly loving God would not intervene in these ways because love requires vulnerability to rejection. Yeah, this is an idea I saw in uh, C.S. Lewis, actually. And I think it's a pretty interesting idea, uh, but I think it's wrong. I think that uh, love does not require vulnerability to rejection. I don't think that the persons of the Trinity, for example, are vulnerable to rejection from one another, but I do think they love each other. So that's a counterexample uh, to this idea that love requires vulnerability to rejection. But also, I think that God, for whatever reason, because of the value of free will maybe, or the value of being in relationship with people who have entered into it freely is vulnerable to rejection, right? The people in hell have already rejected God and maybe are gonna reject God for thousands of years, maybe far longer than that. Um, and so uh, I think that even the, the desideratum set out in the objection is satisfied uh, in, in this case. One thing on that before we move on, suppose instead of, um, instead of hell and heaven in this case, let me change the example slightly and see if this objection gets any more bite. It may not. Um, suppose instead it's you really, really want to be with, uh, this, um, this girl and, it would be a really good thing if you and her had a re relationship, but she rejects you. But you, it's in your power to um, open back up the so that she can see reasons to be with you. Say she's like, sh shut it down and be like, I see no reason to be with him whatsoever. But you have, I don't know, some button that can reopen her up. So then you open back up this possibility for her. And she rejects you again. And then four years later, you press the button again and you nudge her or whatever so that the possibility keeps opening back up. At some point, it seems like, look, she's rejected you. And uh, this 
this isn't loving. <laughs> I don't know. That that's the thought. What what do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so I agree with you uh, that I have the intuition in that case that I, if I had that ability, I shouldn't use it. And one reason for that is that, right, uh, I'm limiting her autonomy to some extent. And I've agreed that it's possible, it's morally permissible to do that in some cases where I'm trading off, you know, for, for their well-being uh, in some important way. Um, uh, but what I want to say is that whatever well-being we're trading off here is not very important <laughs> um, uh, for her. Right. And that's why this case is very disanalogous uh, to the case of, of God uh, and uh, human persons in hell. It's that their, their ultimate good is, is what's at stake here. And although I am very great, Jordan, <laughs> <laughs> I am not this, uh, this uh, woman's ultimate good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Objection four. God's perfect love does not require providing a potentially infinite number of opportunities for repentance. Yeah, and here, um, the, the idea behind this objection is that, look, God is the very best being. And so God should love God's self best of all. And so God should pay more attention to God's own project. Uh, than being unendingly involved in these interventions in damned persons. And what I want to say is that um, I think that omnipotence is, you know, an inexhaustible power. So I think that it's, it's nothing, really, for God, um, give, in view of God's omnipotence, uh, to be continually involved at no detriment to God's own projects uh, for God's self to be continually involved in these interventions in, in damned persons. So uh, given that it's just like lifting a finger for me, uh, for, for God to do all of that, then I think that actually perfect love would uh, engage in these in an unending way, just like if my child was involved uh, in drug addiction uh, in a certain way. And rejected my help. So their drug addiction is promoting their languishing. Um, then I would never stop as a parent. Uh, my love is not perfect, but uh, even as good as it is, it would never stop um, providing opportunities uh, for to promote the, uh, the well-being of my child to uh, restore our relationship, get them off the drugs, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Objection five. It wouldn't let me fit all of it on the screen. So <laughs> I think it left off just a couple words, but we'll get the idea here. So objection five, limitless opportunities for free repentance do not make it probable that everyone will freely repent eventually because the longer a damned person persists in rejecting God, the harder it is for her to repent freely. Good. I think there's a kernel of truth here uh, in this objection that I think in the normal circumstance, our decisions have momentum. So the more somebody rejects God, the easier it is for them to reject God in the future. But what the objection assumes is that God's not intervening to change their character in ways that give them new reasons, like genuinely new reasons to, to repent. So I think that God interrupts that momentum. Uh, at various times to, to reinstate their ability to repent. So what the objection presupposes or assumes is that God's not doing the kinds of interventions that I'm envisioning God can and would do. Mm -hmm. Okay, objection six. It is impossible for the damned to repent and escape hell because hell is unalterable due to its being an eternally static state. Good. So the first thing to notice about this objection is that there's something new here. Uh, we have a new explanation for the permanence of hell, and it's about the metaphysics of hell. It's about its being an eternally static state. 
So the first thing we have to recognize is that uh, this is something adjunct or additional to the free will explanation. And then we have to ask, well, is the free will explanation going to be one of, is the explainer going to want to augment the explanation in this way? And I think no, um, because, right, the free will explanation sets up the obstacle to human salvation in human free will. Um, that's the that's the whole point of mm -hmm. the free will explanation. And here we're, um, if God made hell to be eternally static in this way, then the ultimate reason for why hell is permanent and nobody repents in hell is in located in God's own will, and that's antithetical to the free will explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay, objection seven: the damned can't repent and go to heaven, or else the redeemed can apostatize, apostatize and go to hell. Yeah, so the idea here is that there's going to be symmetry. Look, if people can leave hell for heaven, uh, people can leave heaven for hell, and that's that's really bad. Um, and I agree that that would be bad, um, but I'm going to deny the asymmetry. I'm going to deny the symmetry. I'm going to argue for asymmetry here. Because I think that the condition of the person in hell who has perfected character is going to be very different. Number one, there's going to be no reason inside themselves, given their own character, uh, to, to leave heaven. Uh, because their character has been perfected. They want only what is right, what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, what is God. Mm -hmm. um, and circumstances in heaven are entirely perfect and pleasant. So the circumstances are going to introduce some kind of new tension that provides a reason for them to leave heaven. And the same is true for God's self. God's not going to intervene uh, in their character to give them reasons to, to leave heaven. Um, and so given that it's going to, the source or the reason to leave heaven has got to either come from themselves, their circumstances, uh, or God, and none of these things are providing the reasons to leave hell, then I think that it would be impossible for persons in heaven to, to leave heaven. But think about how different the case is of the persons in hell. Right. Yeah. Of their own selves, their own character, they're going to see no reason to leave hell. Uh, but as I've argued that their circumstances might, because it's attendant with suffering, it's going to give them reasons to rethink their projects. Uh, and also God. Uh, God is intervening in, in their character in ways that reopen the possibility of their repentance. So I think that there's going to be an asymmetry here. People can leave hell for heaven, but not heaven for hell. All right, last objection, and then we're going to wrap up. It is not possible for a damned person to be redeemed because redeemed persons wouldn't be able to rest until their damned loved ones were saved. Yeah, good. Uh, here, I think this is a very clever objection. Matt Anderson over at Baylor gave me an objection like this one. And the idea is that heaven wouldn't be heaven for people who, and I know that you've made videos about this. Maybe you can tell them what videos to, to check out, Jordan. Um, the idea is that heaven wouldn't be heaven for people there because they're seeing their friends, loved ones in hell. And if there's a chance that they can leave hell, as uh, you know, I've argued given the assumptions in the free will explanation, then they're not gonna be able to rest in heaven. And heaven is a place of rest, if nothing else. So we've got a problem here. What I want to deny is that the persons with in heaven would have restlessness. I think that their character has been perfected to such an extent that they'll be able to rest in God and trust God uh, for the well-being of persons in hell uh, in such a way that, yeah, they'll be able to rest in heaven. I got this idea from... Uh, uh, Isaiah 26, 3, uh, that talk about a connection between trusting the Lord and getting peace and being able to rest. Um, and so I think that because persons in heaven do that perfectly, they'll be able to rest. Hmm. All right. So we're at the one hour mark. Let's conclude here. 
Um, you can sum this up however you'd like. Yeah, so you might be surprised to know that in this paper and in this interview, I haven't argued that universalism is true, that is, everyone gets saved. And I haven't argued that it's extremely probable uh, that everyone uh, or that each person in hell uh, will be saved eventually. Really, what I've argued is that there's just an internal problem with the free will explanation. Um, it, it carries the seeds of its own destruction, I think. Uh, what I've argued is that if the view of divine love and hell in the free will explanation is correct, then it is extremely probable that each person in hell will freely repent eventually. And if you know a bit of logic, um, I've only demonstrated, this is a conditional, I've only demonstrated a connection between two ideas. Uh, that itself doesn't tell us what we should believe um, about hell. And I kind of think about this project as the, the first step for, for me. First, I got to figure out what explanations aren't going to work and rule them out uh, and to try to solve the initial puzzle that I began this, uh, this interview and begin the paper with. And then I'll get on to more constructive um, work uh, about how I think, you know, God's love and power is compatible with uh, some people uh, experiencing hell. But I'm, I think it's a hard problem. I'm still thinking about it. Uh, I don't know exactly what to say yet, um, but, you know, hopefully there's, there's more work on this issue coming down the pipeline. Uh, so that's that's what I wanted to say to end this interview. And I should say thank you, uh, Jordan, for, for having me on. I've very much enjoyed our interaction today. Thank you so much for doing this. Once again, the paper is Free Will and the Moral Vice Explanation of Hell's Finality. I have it linked in the description below. You can go and read it if you want to find out more. And with that, I will say, check out my playlist on Heaven and Hell. I've got an interview with Kevin Tempe on the question, why didn't God just create everyone in heaven? And I also have an interview with Adam Pelser on the question of how we can have per uh, perfect bliss in heaven if we know that our loved ones are suffering in hell. So check out those interviews. I really appreciate you watching. Thank you once again, Dr. Hartman. Keep exploring Christianity. <laughs>